Uh, hello, this is Alan Shipnuck back for another Fire Drill podcast, uh, joined by a heavy hitting trio, Michael Bamberger, Matt Janella, and U.S. Open champion Jeff Ogilvie. The big story in golf at this moment is the USGA's move to throttle back the golf ball through this local rule. We want to convene this panel to kick it all around. Um, Jeff, we're going to start with you. Not only are you a, a player, but you're an architect. You have to you have to account for the distance the ball flies. Um, you're also a traditionalist. Uh, what is what is your take on 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 this decision, and how is it going to impact the game at every level in your mind? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just getting my head around it a little bit. Um, they've been threatening this for a while. It seems like. I mean, they've been getting a bit more diligent on their what do they call that report? The distance insights report or whatever it is yeah um yeah i don't know i think it's more complicated than people think i mean you say i'm a purist and i guess my favorite version of golf would be persimmon and balladas around the old course or something you know what i mean that's my but, but that doesn't mean that's everybody's favorite version um so i kind of have empathy for i mean i guess the real driving factor is the golf courses. I mean, when you start seeing Augusta spending millions and millions and millions buying buying neighboring real estate and moving their tees out of bounds and or what used to be out of bounds and the old course sort of moving their tees to other golf courses and having to sort of manipulate what they've got to challenge the best players in the world. I think that's sort of disappointing. So I can sort of see the motivation behind it. Um, I don't think it's quite as simple as just making the best players hit it a little bit shorter and like that fixes all those sort of problems. I think it's way more complicated than that. So I'm not like a massive fan of splitting up the rules. Um, I think business and technology and like the manufacturers are such an integrated part of the game game, and they have been for so long that I think, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm on the fence. I mean, I love the, the philosophy, you know, I think of... Um, preserving the 13th at the Masters and have playing tee in the road hole like off the correct tee and or the original tee and I love all that but golf's never golf's never really been stronger at least in my lifetime I mean you can't get a tee time anywhere at least in Arizona or in Australia you can't get tee times um, golf shops seem to be selling a lot of stuff I mean we've got billions of dollars getting put into the pro game I mean it's it's in a good spot so I'd step forward slowly i guess you know i don't know no one really knows what's going to happen i mean they've done this sort of three times in my career um and if we could have discount the driver length thing that they did because i don't think that really affected very many people um the grooves thing everyone was jumping up and down and going crazy we're not going to get flyers from every time we hit it in the rough and the whole game's going to change it i mean it didn't change anything like it literally changed maybe for six months we sort of scrambled around and messed around with bounces and lofts and different stuff but they worked out how to get us to spin the ball like it used to and off to the races and same with the long putter thing um the intent was to get people to not use long putters and just as many people use long putters now as before maybe even more so this my skepticism about whether it'll actually make any realistic difference um is there a little bit and it's kind of risky i think to sort of split up the rules i don't know maybe i'm seeing that because I've been a paid athlete from a, from golf manufacturers my whole life, I'm not sure, but um, the general public and everybody benefits from all the R and D that they do on our stuff. You know, they they research and development for what we want, and that it's a bit like Formula One in the cars is that it, that sort of filters down, and ten years later that comes into the end user's product. I think if you sort of mess that process up, I mean, maybe. The, do all the, does all the money go into our ball or does all the money go into the average player's ball? And what's the motivation for Titleist or TaylorMade or anybody who makes a ball to sponsor athletes then if people if, if they're going to be so different, you know? And that would completely change the fabric and the the makeup of the whole sport, at least on a professional level. So I don't know. I think it's I, I love the philosophy of not having us hit it so far, but I think it needs to be well thought out. And these things usually work best when they evolve as opposed to get forced. That's my feeling. Michael, you, you didn't have any qualms. You, you wrote a pretty strong piece for firepitcollective.com uh, laying out your thesis that this this was an important moment for the USGA to show some leadership and the, as stewards of the game and um, explain your the emotion behind that that story. Why do you believe this is, this is the right move? 
Yeah, just a quick nod to Jeff, because we've had this experience before. You could just take what Jeff said, print it up and put it in a magazine. It was such a well-reasoned essay almost about why he feels the way he does. But I think it's but I say that in part because I think it's very significant to realize where we all come into the game in different places, including the four of us, including the millions of people who are so passionate about the game. I think the interest here on the USJ and the RNA part is very narrow. Let's just think about three courses that we all know. Pebble Beach, the old course, and Augusta National. You know, occasionally and every year in Augusta's case, those those tournaments are played on those courses and millions of people around the world watch them. And that's an invitation to play the game. When those courses become pitch and putt courses like Cam Smith's 30 on the back nine on the old course last year, it actually creates more of a chasm between us and them and actually makes the game just kind of less appealing. And if we lose those showpieces of, of golf because they be turn into pitch and putt courses, it doesn't serve the game well. I think there's a very narrow goal here of preserving the best, most traditional courses in the world, including Medina, where Jeff's doing work now, but, and really not that many, where golf is played on TV and continue to make them meaningful for the pros and continue to make it aspirational for us. And I think the USGA and the RNA might go down the following path the next couple of years. Much like a kid going from a metal bat to a wooden bat, it would be aspirational for a golfer to someday be at the level where you use the tournament ball. Uh, but it could be very narrow in focus and achieve the goal of preserving the three shot par five, you know, when I was coming up in the game, you had par 72 U.S. Open courses, knocked down to par 70, and one of those par fives would be unreachable and the other would. That was sort of the traditional definition of a par 70 course. That's gone. So to bring that back, to make, to, to make us recognize the value of the game of 18 holes comprising of par fives, par fours, and par threes, uh, where you test every club in the bag. Uh, I think is it would be very useful to the game, but I would be much more narrow in in what do they say rolling out this new rollback. I would start with the four majors. Uh, so Matt, um, did, did the USGA go far enough? I mean, should they have should they have taken a more holistic approach to this, where it's not just about the ball; it's about the the size of the driver. It's about, you know, you, there's a lot of other factors besides the ball, like. Um, you know, I remember when I when I was learning to play the game, it was scary to hit a driver because the head was so small, and if you if you didn't if you caught it on the toe or the heel, it was going to go a million miles offline. Like there was there was risk to swinging a driver, and now the club faces are so big and forgiving that you can swing harder, and you may not catch it in the sweet spot, which you know oftentimes I don't, but you're still going to get it on the face, and it's still going to fly pretty well, and, and you're usually in play. Like they could have taken more dramatic action than just just the golf ball like what, what do you think of, of where they landed on this issue i'm i'm I, like jeff and like probably a lot of people <clears throat> i did take a couple of days i'm still trying to wrap my head around it. i've read several articles i've listened to several podcasts because because i'm trying not to be you know quick to overreact or, or to take some sort of dramatic stand, you know, for the spirit of taking a dramatic stand. And again, I'm an, I'm a, I'm an amateur golfer. We are talking about something that's going to affect 1% of the 1% of the people that swing that hard, that fast, that create that kind of energy with that size of a club, you know, with the current ball, on courses that we see on TV, because let's be honest, this is about golf on TV. And that was my point there. You know, at Augusta National, the membership who plays there day in and day out, the members tease is plenty long enough for all members. And members don't go back and play the, the crazy tease. It's, it, we're talking about, you know, at Riviera, the membership at Riviera, that golf course is plenty long and challenging for them. And at Cypress Point and all the, the difference is Cypress isn't on TV and Riviera and, and Pebble and Old Course are. At Old Course last year, the most benign conditions, absolutely no wind, no, no traditional Scottish weather, which in large part is a factor generally at, in competing at that place over four days. Th this was an outlier of a situation and cam smith won at 20 under and he won it 
by, you know, with his short game, with his chipping and putting. And we marveled at, at his, as it, at his ability. And I think we will in April marvel at people's ability to get up and down around the green and hit the putt. Scotty Scheffler, the chips that are talked about are in those first free few holes of the last round. It's not about what he was hitting into 13 or 15. It was about his short game that, that converted what should have been two or three over to two or three under. That was his short game. So, 1% of 1% on, on uh, for 15 yards, okay, uh, for, you know, why is it just the ball? Uh, why why now, in the middle of the shitstorm that's happening in the world of professional golf, why, why, why now for something that we will contemplate until August and then wouldn't go into effect until 2026? 20, Can we just let this other stuff kind of play out a little bit for a little while longer? If you look at stats and facts that since t- 2004, they're hit, there has been pretty much a, 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 a moderation to what the advancements are happening as it relates to the ball. Courses have made the changes. Augusta bought the land that it needed to make the changes to, uh, to keep the 13th hole relevant. So there's a couple holes, a couple venues, a couple people this involves. And it, we're talking about the tour, the elite level player. Why not just involve the governing bodies and these players? Why put all of us through all of us? Why not go behind closed doors and at least everybody get on the same page that there is some sort of issue that needs to be addressed and then decide how they're going to address it in which they already know that the tour is going to adopt it because if they do this and the tour doesn't adopt it, now we have more of a shit show. Now it's like, well, now what does that mean to the USGA and the RNA? Uh, the, 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 you know, why not just raise the mowing levels of fairway? We see 30 to 40 to 50 yards of rollout right now on these modern mode fairways at these classic venues. That to me is just as much of an issue as swing speed and ball distance because that ball goes and then it just keeps going. So why don't we talk about mower length? Why don't we talk about loft of a driver? Why don't we just, why, why isn't it a combination of a few things? Why is it just the ball? I, to try to simplify such a layered decision uh, uh, and focus on one thing, one factor in the spirit of this, idea that it needs to go back like freeze it now keep it now marvel at cam smith's 30 instead of saying this is a problem marvel at the guy achieved something that should be celebrated forever instead of being the catalyst to some sort of rollback it just doesn't i just think all of it just doesn't it doesn't make sense to me let me rebut a few of those things for the the spirit of conversation i mean why now is because Mike Wan took over the USGA. I mean, they have they have a new leadership. They have a new uh, energy, and um, you know they've they've been they've been talking about this for twenty years. And the game has changed in since they started studying this issue. I don't think there's any doubt. Um, to Jeff's point, even though this rule is only going to affect the pros, there is a trickle down. It will affect the average consumer based on how much these manufacturers. Um, put into R&D and, and what that means to our to our game as well. Um, so it's not a huge factor, but it, it is a factor. So everyone everyone in, in golf is touched in some way. But as golf consumers, I would say, I don't think this is about Cam Smith or even Scotty Scheffler. They're not the guys who are pushing the envelope of, of driving distance. But um, when you see what like, you know, Bryson did to Wingfoot, which is a course that Jeff holds dear, like the, the pro game has evolved to – driver wedge on so many holes but and give as a, Bryce as the, putting some credit there too like everyone thinks he just oh, sure. overpowered wing foot he didn't it was about his short game and his putting that won him the tournament yeah well, that was a factor too but i will say that when when you watch when the tour goes to like an, an old course like i was thinking about the rocket mortgage for instance like every par four guys are hitting wedges into and it gets it gets repetitive it's like just there's no danger it would when when I when a tour player has a wedge, a bad shot's going to be thirty feet. Like there, it just takes all the dispersion out of it. The water's not in play. The the trees and the bunkers aren't in play. And I do notice as a golf viewer that there's a sameness to the way the holes get played, and and there's there's just not that sense of they're not walking a tightrope like they used to because the clubs are. It's not just a, everyone likes to watch them hit it a long way off the tee, but it's what happens after that. I mean it. I just think it's a less compelling product. And as you said, it's a TV show. And 
as as a viewer who's been watching golf for a long time, I think it's a lot more boring now because of the way they play the game. That's that's my personal feeling. No, I'm totally with you, Alan. I, I think you said that. I would say it the same way. The only way, and I would add to that, I would add, I agree with what Matt's saying. It's not just one factor. And Alan, to your point is, it used to be a little scary to hit a driver. I mean, even just in the 30 years that we've been playing together, Alan, I've gone from scared of the driver to love the driver, in part because that ball doesn't curve as much as it used to, in part because I get to hit way up high, put it forward and, and launch it, in part because of the way people design golf courses today with no rough and 60 yard fairways. There's no scare factor. So to Matt's point, and I'm sure we'd all agree with this, it isn't just one factor, but the golf ball is a place to start as Nicholas has been saying literally for, for, for 30 or 40 years. Jeff, how long will it take for the pros to get their 15 or 17 or 18 yards back? I mean, you mentioned the grooves. Um, there's, there's always, there's always a workaround. Like um, there's, there's going to be a way to, to they they roll the ball back, but it seems like people are clever enough that they can they can they can squeeze out more yardage, whatever they're given. Like, is is this is this only going to be an issue for a few years and then they'll back be back to where they were right now? I imagine it's probably going to go that way. I mean, I don't know how they would do that, but and look, I don't know enough about the science that I'd be pretending like I I'll just be regurgitating what other people say, but I feel like. One of the knocks on the way they measure is they've always just measured off that one club. It's that, that one certain condition and they measure how far the ball goes and they, it, that's sort of the line. But there's, you, I, there's stuff in the equipment that we have now that triggers at certain speeds and it, it can change at certain conditions. I mean, they could I conceivably design a ball that passed this test that you just swing it a little bit slower and put a little bit more spin on it with a different amount of loft on your driver or something and they'll work out how to get it going far again you know I mean, they're gonna do it um which is why i think this is well it just needs to be well thought out if everyone thinks it's the way it should go and i mean i just one little point that michael made about 60 yard fairways and no rough i mean augusta's got plenty of scary shots for 60 yard wide fairways um and i don't think i mean look there was a great Someone wrote it about Hogan or it was a quote of Hogan's or someone said that this was how he viewed his golf. I mean, he measured his drives. He analyzed his drives in terms of position. He didn't measure them in terms of distance. So position to him was more important than out and out distance. I mean, distance is a part of position. But we've, ever since the last 20, as this was happening with the equipment, the golf courses just played into the the manufacturer's hands and just rewarded exponentially rewarded distance so disproportionately from everything else the reason you see what you see on tour is the golf courses are set up to challenge you to hit it as far as you can and if you do you can succeed if you don't you can't so 20 30 years ago pros weren't going home with launch monitors and working on swinging with heavy and lightweight clubs and trying to max out their speed and watching long drivers swing it on Instagram. That just wasn't a thing. We were going home trying to work on our soft little fade with a six iron because that was what was rewarded. And so the golf courses and the way they've set up and the reactiveness, I mean, this is a bit of a reaction too, a slow one, but a reaction. The reactiveness sort of the last evolution of the reaction was to make golf courses longer and to challenge long hitters more. Well, that just makes us want to hit it further. Um, and if you take a ball and make it go shorter, we're just going to work out how to make it go further. How, how, we're going to work out how to have the lowest score we can on the courses we get presented. Um, and I think it's very realistic to present courses that proportionately reward distance, not disproportionately. Um, I mean, I know that's kind of what the USGA were trying to do at Wingfoot and all that. And I guess it's not an exact science and you can't do it always. But um, we're just going to try to do – I say we as, as a professional golfer – we're just going to try to get our games to the point that get rewarded the most on the challenges we get put. And if you just keep putting longer and longer courses that reward distance, that's all we're going to focus on. Um, I think it's just more complicated than just changing the way you measure the ball and making certain conditions go a bit shorter off the driver. I think it's a holistic – if you genuinely want golf to have a smaller footprint and use less water and not have to buy land next door and all these – things that are, I think should be the really the only reason we do this is to preserve golf courses um, because whether someone hits at 3.30 on TV or 3.15 on TV, you can't, that doesn't translate. Like every, any, every, any average golfer goes down and watches PGA Tour players hit 
any shots really they're blown away it wouldn't even matter if the ball went 30 yards shorter they'd watch that and go wow how good is that like the the entertainment product is great regardless of whether it goes 330 or 315 um i think it's got to be a holistic approach to bring distance back into a sensible level of reward as opposed to disproportionately and i think the general reaction with all golf courses is just like, how long can we make this? We've got to make these long guys have to hit it even longer. And that's just encourages the issue from my perspective anyway. And, and I'd point to, to those, that perspective there, Aaron Hills versus Harbor town, Aaron Hills, big, long, essentially built for the modern game played by modern players. Brooks Kepka wins because he was like the best driver of the week. Versus Harbor Town, you have to hit. You can't drive it through the fairway. You have to shape it right and left. You have to hit your spots. You have to hit those small greens. Harbor Town, like I think the answer is more towards Harbor Town and less Aaron Hills, which is exactly what you know built in the you know '60s versus built you know built in the 2000s. I mean, that's a big fundamental difference that played right into a long driver's long driver's hands. I mean, Augusta is still one Zach Johnson and Danny Willett and Trevor Immelman. And some of these, you know, some of these guys who win the masters, you know, Brooks Kepka uh, and, and Dustin Johnson and, and, or Adam Scott, or, you know, it's not the longest hitter that's not dominating the tours. Brandon Matthews is not dominating anything. The, where is the last time the longest hitter wins the tournament? It's just, it's still so much more nuanced than just going out and ripping at 340. I don't care what you have into the green. You still have to chip and putt. Where the pin placements are, what the green complexes look like, how the green speeds are running, the bunker positions. It's so, you know, it's so much more complex than just like we need to roll the ball back 15 yards. Bryson pitched, chipped, and putted the ball like a madman when he would at Wingfoot. So I'm not taking anything away from that. But basically, hole after hole after hole, he had driver as far as he possibly could to rough that he could play out of. Uh, it was it was almost meaningless meaningless to him. And I think when you know when we talk about length, and it always goes to driver, but like the hooded five iron on a hot fairway that goes two fifty, Hogan hit drivers two fifty to the position he wanted to hit it and was happy to do it. So the hooded five iron is a tee shot. It doesn't challenge Jeff Ogilvy and and the two hundred other best players in the world. Uh, but if I could just pose one question, because Jeff is the only architect uh, 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 in this conversation, we're all architects in our minds. But Jeff actually is an architect. Jeff, do do you see in your playing life, and as you're thinking about Medine and some of the other courses we work on, that the the, the notion of the traditional golf course comprising par fives, par fours, and par threes is being challenged by the 250-yard five iron off the tee and the 330-yard drive. I don't know. We don't really build stuff for tour players. Um, Madonna's an, an exception, and we're obviously like having to think about that. I don't think so. I mean, look, it's just a bigger footprint than it was before, really. I mean, um, I mean, we're all like we all sort of fall in love with the game. And we think of the game as its best when we were like the most in love with it, right? Usually, like, I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, some people still get around saying vinyl records are better than Spotify. No, Jeff, vinyl like, records are better than maybe, Spotify. But Spotify, I've got every song in the world on my phone, you know? I mean, there's, that's pretty good, you know? Um, and it's like persimmon blades and balladas at the old course and wearing like tweed jackets and stuff. I mean, that that's really cool and nostalgic and stuff, but the game has always evolved and it's always been moving forward. Um, it definitely accelerated 20 years ago. Um, I think Carsten Solheim's got a big part of this with that ping lawsuit, I think sort of triggered a couple of things. One, that, wow, there's crazy amounts of improvement in equipment, guys. Look, if you just put a bit of science into this, you can make people better. And he sort of showed people that for real. And that the manufacturers could push the envelope a little bit, and the man and the rules bodies would be scared to keep up a little bit. That, that that was a pretty important situation, I think. That ping, that whole ping groove issue, and ever since then, I mean, it's just got faster. But everything has too. I mean, you can't stop time, you know, like you just can't. I think golf 
is an incredible game now. Do I think there's probably a bit more depth and nuance back with the old stuff? Probably. It was more about you and less about the equipment you were using before. Now it's a, the equipment's a bigger part of golf, but that's just part of what it is. And I mean, speaking from a from the player's side of things, I mean, these manufacturers, they've put us on TV, they've advertised us, we're in magazines, we've got big billboard golf bags and hats. They're part of the celebrity of the whole thing. Like they're, 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 part, they're such an integral part of the thing. If we'd all just used no-name equipment forever, tour players wouldn't be as celebrity. It wouldn't be as big a deal. It just wouldn't be. It's just a big part of the enthusiasm and money and everything that came into the sport. So it's so intertwined to just change one tiny little thing and expect the whole thing to come back to where everybody wants it. I just don't think that's going to happen. And I think there's risk involved, which I think at a time when – the spirit of this change or this suggestion is that golf is in a bad place, I think is awful because I think golf's in an amazing place. Um, you can choose to go out and play Goat Hill with a persimmon wood if you want. You know, the game that – whatever game that you want, you can go find. You know, you can get on eBay. You can buy whatever equipment you want. You can go play the game that you want to play. Um, professional golf has never been more appealing, it doesn't seem like, to the, to the money people in the world. Corporate – the corporate world – Saudi Arabia, everybody is obsessed with professional golf at the moment. I mean, I think it's it's so complicated that one little rule I don't I think is risky and I think it needs to be well thought out. And someone mentioned it, I can't remember, that everyone needs to get on the same everyone needs to get in the same room. You know, you get tight, the manufacturers and the the rules bodies and the golfers and a cross section of everybody from every level of golf and like really think this out. Cause I think as I said at the start, I mean I my favorite version of the game is probably a little smaller version than the we play right now, but that doesn't mean that's the best version for everybody. Um, and I think it needs to be just thought out and philosophically, where, where do we think we can sort of put the guardrails or the regulations on this sport to sort of keep it in the, keep it in the sort of wavelength we want to keep it in and just keep it inside there and off you go. You can't stop evolution of equipment. You can't stop the evolution of like working on our bodies and working on our techniques and you just you can't you just can't stop that stuff it's just and it's part of why people play i mean if you go to st andrews and you go through i mean it's the original of the original and you go through all those old golf shops i mean they were coming up with clubs to play out of water that were like that had holes in them and like scoopy looking faces and they had things that looked like hybrids 100 years ago i mean they this has been part of the game forever um, and you definitely have to put regulations. I mean, you have to put sort of a line in the sand somewhere, I guess. Um, but just doing this isn't going to stop that move forward of this sport. It's always just going to keep doing it. Um, cause to be honest, that's part of why people play it. I mean, my dad loved golf, but I think he loved walking around a golf shop and buying new golf clubs more, you know, for him, golf was the promise of distance and the, the new clubs or this putter is going to make more putts or this driver is going to go further on finally going to be able to draw the ball or whatever it is. That to him and a lot of people, that's golf. That's their favorite part of it. And I think when you start messing around with stuff like that, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit woke in that it's just this sort of this narrow, loud band of rollback headspace that makes the most noise, you know. And look, I, and I, as I said, I, I'm, I'd be in that crowd quietly, you know what I mean? But I think when you make so much noise over there, you forget about all the other great things in the sport. And I just think probably some lines have to be drawn in the sand at some point because you, balls that go 450 yards, that's silly. And at some point, if it was unregulated, that would happen. Um, but I think it just has to be done clever, cleverly and well thought out and not rushed into well, it's important to note that this these are not this is not a rule yet. This is a this is a proposal and a suggestion, and this is the beginning of the comment period where the USGA is soliciting feedback from the manufacturers, from from players, from everyone in the game. So, we'll, we'll see how how this evolves based on the feedback. And you're right, Jeff. There are there are different constituents that are that are noisy, and whether that'll have an effect on uh, what they do or not, we'll see. But I'm not sure if the the spear behind this is that the golf is in a bad place, or more, more, maybe it's golf is in a great place and we want to keep it here. We because 
if if you get i think in, in 2022 the driving distance among the, like the elite pros went up four percent which is not nothing and if it goes up four percent and then four percent four percent then all of a sudden if you're driving 25 yards further than right now that could that becomes problematic on on some golf courses and, and some championships so uh everyone's saying well they're, they're trying to take us back in time maybe it's just they're trying to slow down the progress a little bit because whatever they they cook up as you know there, there's going to the players will find a way. They all they always do. It, I don't think this ends progress. I think this just slows it. Um, it you know, I, I think that it's okay to have those guardrails, but uh, pe- people may disagree with that. You know, you know why Zach Johnson's a Hall of Famer in my mind? Because he's won at Augusta and the Old Course. <laughs> Like Zach Johnson, in the middle of all this, the guy. You know, it it, it just that that. That that's that one percent, that group of people that that's that is going is going to be impact impacted here. And again, why would this all play out in the in in this public forum? Why wouldn't they have already gotten in the rooms with all the people that it's going to impact and have everybody on the same page and make it seem like there is actual thought and leadership and you know and some sort of efficient execution to say this doesn't impact anybody. This is all it impacted. We met with them. They're on board. They're going to implement it. This is how that's going to be used. Like this sort of uh, crazy discourse of reaction and overreaction and misinformation and, and, and ill-informed just, it's just not, I don't think this is good for the game right now. And I think this is another opportunity for the, for the people to say, why, you know, golf is such a good play. Like just, you know, the T sheets are packed. Just let it go. Let it, let it happen behind closed doors. But I mean, if they'd done that, I think there would have been a, a bigger reaction. Like this is, this is the fixes in and you didn't listen to the, the stakeholders. But it's only impacting those tour players at those events, at those venues. Yeah, but as Jeff notes, I mean, the tour the tour players have a very specific agenda. They're paid by the manufacturers. They're predisposed to taking that side of things. So they, get them all in a room. Get them all in a room. Yeah. Don't let people get in press conferences and start, you know, just, just, uh, it, it's You're yet an another now. layer of mess. You know, we got tour versus live, and now we got <laughs> tour players versus a rollback versus the governing bodies with representing manufacturers. Oh, my God. Great, great news. I think if the tour players had their way, that nothing would ever change. It would just be like, let us just get, our, let us just keep going and going and going. And um, and it might be that way. They might not implement this. They might not the tour. Why would the tour do this? And who's going to make a ball for that small of a marketplace? Who's going to make a ball that they sell only to a people group of people who don't actually buy balls? Well, they're, they're, those people on TV, though. I mean, you still you still want if you're Titleist, you still want your ball to win the Masters and, and the U.S. Open. Like they will make the ball, but well, and I guarantee uh, you, if you've been to R and D play, Titleist is still going to be the number one ball. No one does golf balls better than Titleist. If you've been to their their fact, I'm not paid by Titleist, but I've been around to different different factories, and Titleist is always going to make the best ball. They just that's what they're very good at. They're just incredible at it. and they have got decades and decades and millions and gajillions of dollars into R&D. They're going to it just I don't know. This is so weird to me. I think Alan to 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 your point, you know, when you say another 4% year after year, we've had that 4% for a long long time now. And now we're, you know, now we're talking about 350 where they used to talk about 275. Uh when when Jeff talks about a line in the sand, the time for a line in the sand came a long time ago, uh, and they and the USJ and the RNA missed its chance to draw the line in the sand. So at some point, it has to be the time to do it. Uh, when Jeff says there's always going to be advances, yeah, there are always going to be advances, but at the same at the same time, he says, but there's always going to have to be requirements uh, for rules. Yeah, there are going to be requirements for the rules. So why not now? Because now is already too late. Well, it's a fascinating topic. I don't think this is going to be our last conversation about this, and we'll, we'll see how, how it all plays out. But um, it's good to get some different thoughts. I think we're all coming at it from a, – there's a continuum, and Michael's on one end, Matt's on the other. I think Jeff and I are in the middle, and that, that's why it's kind of interesting. There's, there's not a right or wrong. I watched Jeff play Goat Hill Park at the Wishbone Brawl with uh, you know uh, Persimmon Woods 
and and on a 4500 yard golf course you know jeff practiced round the day before the wishbone brawl you know i think you were like even par or something you know t- through 12 holes or maybe one on the next day you sharpened up you made a bunch of putts you made seven birdies you worked the ball like it's it was an incredible display of of artistry um, that, you know, not a, any of us are ever going to be able to execute. Or, and it was fun. 4,500 yards. Again, have a tournament at a 4,500-yard golf course where everyone plays persimmons and, and balada balls. Oh, my God, that could be something that would be that would be an implication of, of like a little modern set of rules at a different venue. What, you know, why isn't that? Why, you know, that's a rollback of club, you know, not a ball. But of distance of the golf course, not of how far the ball goes. It's a combination of a lot of things, and that in itself was intriguing. And it, you know, I don't. But but there's kids now that have never played a, a persimmon wood. So why would like that's not even they don't even know what that even means. They've never held one in their hands. It's so layered and complex. Well, hopefully for the listeners, we've cut through some of those layers and, and brought a little <laughs> insight. Um, Just added to confusion. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe we're all, maybe maybe we'll let, we'll let this marinate and we'll come back again in a week and it'll make oh. more sense. But, uh, not not for Matt. Matt's done. Um, <laughs> but uh, all right, well let's um, let's let's call this uh, Act One in in a, in a multi-act play, and we'll uh, we'll keep revisiting as as uh, as this the twists and turns of, of this plot continue. But uh, I think I think it's a good start, and I appreciate all the different perspectives here. So. Um, we're going to wrap up this fire drill podcast uh, for Michael Bamberger, Matt Janella, and most especially Jeff Ogilvy. Uh, this is Alan Shipnuck. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back at it soon. I bet big and I played to win. Made a fortune when my ship came in. I ran the table, never thought I could fall. Then the winter time hit me like a cannonball. And now I can't shake this losing streak Every road I take is a dead end street I got thoughts in my head, can't get them out Trying not to think what I'm thinking about I got thoughts in my head, can't get them out Try.